This is my Audi TT225. I've done a lot of work to this car over the past year to get it to where it is currently, and we're going to continue setting it up for proper autocross and road course events. My long-term goal for this car is to throw on a bigger turbo, but we've got a few supporting mods that we need to do beforehand. First and foremost, we need to get a bigger intercooler on this car. Shipping has been horrible lately, so that'll likely be in the next TT video. Since we're still on the shipping hold for the front mount intercooler, I'm gonna upgrade the intake system of this car even further and put on a new silicone turbo inlet pipe. I'm gonna spend the second half of the video going over my approach to finding boost and vacuum leaks in a car like this, because we end up running into one. Thankfully, the mechanics of this engine make it pretty easy to find the location of boost leaks when you run into them. If you're just here for that, feel free to skip to halfway. First and foremost, let's go over the turbo inlet pipe. The air intake system for this car is really simple and there's only a few stages. In this case, we only care what happens before the turbo. Air comes in through the intake into the turbo inlet pipe, which goes into the turbo. It's this gray pipe right here. You want to upgrade this piece for a few reasons, and one of the main ones is that the stock one likes to go out. I've went with Forge Motorsports for many of the other silicone hoses on this car, and today's not really going to be an exception to that. This is their turbo inlet pipe for the 225. If you've never seen one of these outside of the car, you might be wondering, hey, what are those extra holes for? I understand that it feeds air into the turbo, but where do those go? Well, the turbo inlet pipe is designed to filter air for more than just the turbo. It feeds most of the other air-based systems in this car, including the diverter valves, the N249, the N75, and the brake booster. In other words, there's quite a few things you're gonna need to disconnect and reconnect when you do this. Thankfully, this is a lot easier to do than it initially sounds. You take off the intake and slowly start removing each one of the connections to the OEM turbo inlet pipe. You might be worried about accidentally removing a coolant line, but so long as you make sure that they're connected to the turbo inlet pipe, you'll be fine. The only thing that should be in there is air. It also doesn't matter which order you remove these in. I personally removed the PCV, then the diverter valve, then the N75, and finally the brake booster. This was just the order that seemed easiest for me. Unless you have small arms and hands, the hardest part about this is reaching the hose clamp that wraps around the turbo itself. I decided to take off this charge pipe so that I had more room to reach behind the engine and around back behind the turbo. You're gonna end up hugging your engine a lot for this job, so I suggest you make sure that it is completely cold before you even attempt sticking your hand back there. Turbos get a little warm. It's probably going to take you a few tries, but once you actually get the hose clamp off, you should be able to just pull the turbo inlet pipe out through the top. Now that I have this turbo inlet pipe off, I can get the camera back there and show you where this hose clamp was. What you see me doing now is checking the health of my turbo by looking for shaft play or damage to the compressor wheel. Doesn't seem like there's much turbo play, which is honestly pretty good. Maybe we'll throw this KO4 in the S4. Here's the OEM turbo inlet pipe next to the nice Forge one, which is next to my buddy's eBay special that he found for $20. I kind of wanted to compare all three to see what the build quality looks like. The Forge is shaped the most like the OEM, but it has an increased inner diameter, which will allow for a little bit more airflow. It's also made of a thicker ply silicone, which makes it less likely to collapse under a high air intake rate. There are a ton of horror stories online of the OEM turbo inlet pipe closing due to high pressure. If your engine is tuned, it's gonna take in a lot more air than the car normally Normally would. If your air intake can't quite meet this demand, the weakest link is actually going to be your turbo inlet pipe, which causes the OEM one to collapse up near the neck where the material is the thinnest. Kind of like when you get the end of a plastic straw stuck on a piece of fruit in a smoothie. For how cheap my buddy found the eBay special, I'm honestly really impressed with the quality. If you're looking for a replacement for OEM and for something to be as cheap as possible, this may be a decent alternative. It's not nearly as well made as the Forge, but it's decently well made. It's silicone, so it'll be be more resilient than the stock, however the inner diameter is a bit less and you may need to cut a little bit to fit some of the lines. The install of the new piece is pretty simple. The biggest thing you gotta remember is to face the hose clamp for the turbo like this so you can actually reach the screw. You may need to put a little bit more effort into pushing this into the original place because it's a more resilient silicone. This is also going to be the first hose clamp you want to tighten since otherwise you won't be able to actually reach it. The rest of the install is equally simple. 
simply reattach all the things you took off into their new locations on the new turbo inlet pipe. The order you do this doesn't matter, but you're going to want to take your time and make sure that you tighten the hose clamps well. We wouldn't want any unmoderated air entering our turbo, now would we? This is as close to a view of the bottom of the turbo inlet pipe as I could get. The lighting down here was god awful and if I stuck the camera any further you couldn't actually see anything. Right where my fingertip ends is where the actual turbo inlet pipe hose clamp is. Some of my European viewers might wonder why I didn't go with an oversized turbo inlet, and it's really a pretty simple answer. There's a really good chance this pipe is going to not work when I upgrade the turbo. I got the forge piece for a steel, and it's still a fantastic upgrade over OEM. Oversized turbo inlet pipes are nice, but if it's just going to be obsolete when I upgrade the turbo, I would rather wait. I also couldn't really find an oversized turbo inlet pipe that would ship to the States, and I feel like paying all the import and shipping fees for one that's oversized would be a little bit overkill if I'm just going to replace it with the turbo. I went through and reconnected all the hoses to the turbo inlet pipe, double checking all the hose clamps to make sure that none of them had vacuum leaks. After this I went ahead and reinstalled the charge pipe and the different pipes connected to it. Now, you might be wondering, did my car feel any faster when I had the turbo inlet pipe installed? My answer is no, not really. I can quantify this with a road dyno if you guys would like to see it, but from what I can tell, the car feels right about the same. My stock turbo inlet pipe had no problems, and I already had an aftermarket intake, so it's not like it was struggling to suck in air. If you had a tear in your turbo inlet pipe, your intake pipe was closing, or if you bought the oversized turbo inlet pipe, I could see this providing a little bit of extra horsepower. It does, however, make my diverter valve sound a lot louder, which I definitely like. It also looks fantastic, so I'm glad I did it. It's been a minute since we installed the new turbo inlet pipe, and I think something we did caused a vacuum leak, so I'm gonna go through and take you through my process of how I go about finding where a vacuum leak is and fixing it. I've had so many boost and vacuum problems in this car that I've gotten pretty good at actually finding what's the cause of them and where they are. This is not the only approach to doing this. If you'd rather smoke test or use another method or process, go ahead. Some people have asked me how I've done it, so I thought I would talk about it in a little bit more detail. Here are some prerequisites to know about before I go into diagnosing my car. My car is tuned to reach 20 PSI at full boost and generally idles at negative 20. With the air conditioner on, this drops to around negative 17. If you don't have a boost gauge in your your car, definitely consider getting one. It is so critical in determining if your car is as healthy as it really seems. I've been wanting to upgrade mine too, so if anybody wants to see a tutorial, let me know and I'm happy to do it. Let's get into diagnosing now. I like to use the diverter valve as a starting point to determine which part of the vacuum system the problem is located in. What I mean by this is you can determine which side of the diverter valve is the problem based on how it responds, assuming your diverter valve both works properly and is rated for the amount of horsepower you're using. When I say side of the diverter valve, I mean is the leak related to the system that opens the diverter valve, or is the actual boost and intercooler piping that goes through the diverter valve the problem? To really understand how the boost system doesn't work, you need to understand what it does when it's working. You need to know how your car behaves so that you can tell what's wrong with it. When I'm driving my car and I'm in boost, as soon as I throw in the clutch, it actuates the diverter valve and it immediately drops my vacuum pressure to my idle value of 20. I use this as my baseline. If my car is actuating the diverter valve and building vacuum notably slower, I know that the vacuum leak has to be along the lines connected to the top of the diverter valve. This cuts the amount of lines I have to check nearly in half. If your vacuum leak here is sizable, you'll also consistently have a lower idle vacuum reading. That reading may jump around a bit depending on how small the leak is. You can isolate this section even further. The TT has an N249 system which contains a vacuum reservoir. It's this little black box on top of the manifold. The job of this is to store vacuum pressure while it's not needed so it's available when you need it, such as when you first start the car and help the car to build vacuum faster as you throw in the clutch. You know you have a problem near the vacuum reservoir if your car loses vacuum pressure overnight and doesn't have a good vacuum pressure when you first start it up. Another thing to note about this N249 side is that if the system really isn't working and your diverter valve isn't actuating, it will make a turbo flutter noise. This sounds cool, but it's actually really bad for the turbo and our engines because it's not tuned for that. There are quite a few lines connected to the N249 system, but they're really simple to replace if you happen to find a leak. They 
they both end up going under the intake manifold and into the metal bracket in front of them. If you just feel around under the manifold, they're really easy to find. Mine are already replaced in red, and I know they're connected well, so I don't think these are going to be the problem. Underneath the intake manifold, you'll also notice that there is another line that starts on the left side and connects over to where your boost gauge is generally installed. This is another line that commonly goes out, and you're going to want to replace it because it's made of some really, really cheap material. Now let's look at the other case, when the N249 system is working fine and your vacuum gets actuated like normal. From my experience, the key to finding the boost leak, if it doesn't have to do with the actuation of the diverter valve, is to determine what your boost is actually doing. This is going to require you to get your car actually into boost and see how it behaves. If your boost is completely erratic and won't hold consistently, it's due to your N75. Check the three lines related to this or if your N75 is the actual problem. If your boost is consistent, but it's consistently lower than what you're generally expecting, we need to determine if it is because of a software lock, such as limp mode, or if it's a hardware problem. Software limp mode is pretty easy to detect. Your car should hit around 5 PSI consistently, no matter how much throttle you give it. This is just the car's way of protecting itself if you happen to have overboosted or something like that. Another case is if you make absolutely no boost at all. In this case, it's likely one of the larger pipes that just popped off because it wasn't tightened down enough. Or if it is a leak, it's a leak in like an intercooler piping and it is a massive one. Check all of the large pipes from the turbo back to the intake manifold. If it's not a software lock and you're just making a little bit less than normal boost, it's most likely one of the smaller lines along the boost intake paths. Check the two lines from the charge pipe back to the turbo inlet pipe in the N75, as well as all of the smaller lines under the intake manifold and into the 249 system. A very common boost line is the braided vacuum hose that goes to the left side of the intake manifold and over to where you generally install a boost gauge. As a general rule of thumb, you can preemptively check all of these or just do what I did and do the right thing and replace all of the old lines to get rid of the worry completely. It's not nearly as much of a hassle as you would think. I've ran into almost all of these problems, so I ended up making a flow chart that I use almost all the time when I'm looking for a vacuum leak. If you think it's gonna help you, feel free to take a screenshot and follow it for yourself. Like I said, it's not perfect, and it's a work in progress as I continue to have problems with the car, so every time I update it, I'll keep you guys updated and post a new one. Following my own diagnosis flow chart, I knew almost immediately what was causing my problem. At startup, my car had almost no idle vacuum pressure, but as I drove it, I was able to build it like normal. This makes me think that I have a leak in the N249 system, specifically one related to the vacuum reservoir. The car would be leaking its vacuum overnight so that when it started up in the morning, it had a much lower vacuum pressure than normal. But the leak wasn't big enough that it would lose all the vacuum pressure as I was driving it. It was slowly leaking out overnight. I checked this and sure enough, the hard plastic line had cracked in my N249 system. I likely leaned on it while I was reaching the turbo inlet pipe, and since it was colder outside, it just cracked. Now we get into the fun part of having a really obscure part that you need to find online, or in actuality, a part you need to find a replacement for for the time being. This is the same diameter as a plastic pen, so I decided to chop one in half and use that as a temporary hard pipe. Before you all get upset, no, this is not a permanent fix, but it is kind of funny. This is just good enough to get me to go to the automotive store when I can get a plastic hard pipe. Although I do think it's pretty funny how you can see the BIC logo. And it's always fun to invent your own parts for a very obscure purpose like this. I am beyond excited that we finally have a turbo inlet pipe installed on the TT. What this really means is there are only a few vacuum lines and boost lines that I haven't replaced yet. And as soon as my front mount intercooler kit comes in, we're going to replace the rest of them. We're unfortunately at the liberty of how long it takes to ship for both the front mount intercooler and the coilovers, however. But in the next episode, I'm hoping to do one of those. The car's really starting to come together now. If there are any parts you want to see me put on this car, let me know. Thank you so much for watching. The amount of support you guys have been giving me is absolutely insane. I plan on having project cars for the rest of my life and documenting everything I do here. If that sounds interesting to you, or you like the video, or you learned something, consider dropping a like and subscribing. Seriously, thank you for giving this video your time of day. Have a wonderful day.